والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كل ان كان اباؤكم وابناؤكم واخوانكم وازواجكم وعشيرتكم واموال اقترفتموها وتجاره تخشون كسادها ومساكن ترزقون احب اليكم من الله ورسوله وجهاد في سبيله فتربصوا حتى ياتي الله بامره والله لا يحب الفاسقين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي دي اونوربل گورنر اوف ويست جافا ماي ريسپكت ايلدرز اند ماي ديير برذرز اند سيسترز اي ويلكم اول اوف يو وذ اسلاميك غريتينجز السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala of Almighty God be on all of you. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be in Indonesia, especially in Batung, the capital of West Java, and I'm overwhelmed with the warm welcome and the honor that I received in the city of Batung. and i would like to thank the government the governor the police for all the arrangement that they made and yesterday when i landed in the train station i was impressed with the welcome i got and i saw that hundreds of policemen were there on both the sides of the roads this is given only to some selected head of states and i don't happen to be a head of state but i'm happy that the people of batung and indonesia they love adai who is a servant of allah alhamdulillah the topic of this morning's talk of mine is dawa or destruction dawa in urdu where i come from india the moment you hear the word dawa you start thinking of a lunch party or a dinner party you start thinking of mutton biryani or chicken biryani dawa does not mean mutton biryani chicken biryani or lunch party or dinner party dawa in arabic means an invitation it means a call 
And today, we will not be talking about an invitation to a lunch party or dinner party. We'll be talking about an invitation to Islam. We'll be speaking about Dawud or Islam. And an invitation is only given to an outsider. A person who belongs to the same house, you don't give an invitation. Invitation is given to an outsider. So Dawa specifically means inviting people to Islam, especially the non-Muslims. When we speak to a Muslim, giving him more information about Islam, the more appropriate Arabic word is Islam, which means to improve, which means to correct, which means to rectify. Though both these budawa is synonymously used for doing, for giving the message of Islam to Muslim and non-Muslims alike, but more specifically, Dawa in Arabic means inviting the non-Muslims and Islam means speaking to a Muslim, giving him more information about Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhridat linnas. Allah is telling in the Quran, O ye Muslims, ye are the best of peoples evolved for mankind. Allah is giving us an honor and calling us Muslims as the khaira ummah, the best of people evolved for humankind. Whenever there is honor, it is always followed up with responsibility. There is no honor without responsibility. For example, in a school, the principal has got more honor than a teacher. A teacher has got more honor than a student. Similarly, the principal has got more responsibility than a teacher. The teacher has got more responsibility than a clerk. There is no honor without responsibility. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, is giving us Muslims an honor and calling us as the best of people. Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhridat linnas. Don't you think we have a responsibility? The reply is given in the same verse and Allah continues. Ta'miruna bil ma'roofi wa tanahuna anil murkar. Wa tu'minuna billah. Because we enjoin what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. Allah is calling us the khaira ummah because we enjoin people towards the good and we forbid them from doing wrong. That means we are supposed to call the non-Muslims and give them more information about Islam. If a Muslim is making a mistake, correct him. Call him towards the good and forbid him from doing wrong and believe in Allah. If we do not enjoin what is good, and if we do not forbid what is wrong, if we do not do dawah and islah, we aren't fit to be called as khaira ummah. We aren't fit to be called as Muslims. It is a fard, compulsory for every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to those who are not aware of it. And today we find in the international media, they are spreading misconceptions about Islam. And most of the non-Muslims, they do not have the correct information about Islam. It is the duty of every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to those who are not aware of it. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 143, that we have made you an ummat a wast a middlemost community, so that you will be a witness over the nations and the Prophet will be witness over you. It is compulsory that every Muslim should convey the message of Islam to those who are not aware of it. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the Quran, from Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 24. And this verse happens to be from Surah Tawbah chapter 9, which is one of the most militant surah of the glorious Quran. Why do I say that Surah Tawbah 
is one of the most militant surah of the glorious Quran because it is the only surah, the only chapter in the Quran which does not begin with the beautiful formula Bismillah Rahman Rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Otherwise, every chapter of the glorious Quran besides Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 begins with the beautiful formula Bismillah Rahman Rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Why does Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, does not begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Let me give you an example. Suppose, if you are walking with your wife, or with your mother, down the streets of Batum, and if suppose there is a hooligan, there is a ruffian, who snatches the handbag of your wife or of your mother and runs away. What will you do? But naturally you'll chase him. And when you catch up with him, you will not say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace of Allah and blessings be upon you. You will not say that, you will not say, Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. When you catch up with that thief, you say, hey mister, give me the handbag, I'll break your neck. Hey mister, give me the handbag, I'll break your leg you will get down to the subject directly. Bismillah is uncalled for. Similarly, in this surah, this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving an ultimatum to the mushriks of Makkah. If you read the first few verses of, of the surah, Surah Tawbah chapter number 9, it speaks about a peace treaty between the Muslims and the mushriks of Makkah. And this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the mushriks of Makkah. By the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 5, He is telling the mushriks of Makkah, Put things straight in four months time, otherwise a declaration of war. Now when Allah is giving a warning to the mushriks of Makkah, He is getting down to the subject directly. Bismillah is uncalled for. But by the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 24, the ayah I quoted in the beginning of my talk, Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 24, now Allah is addressing us Muslims. Now we Muslims, we are in the firing line. And Allah says, Kul, tell them, in kana abaukum, whether that be for your fathers, wa abnaukum, or your sons, wa ikhwanukum, or your brothers, azwajkum, or your spouses, or your wives, ashiratukum, or your relatives. Allah is asking, what are your considerations? Are they your fathers? Are they your sons? Are they your brothers? Are they your spouses? Husbands or wives? Are they your relatives? And Allah continues. What The wealth you have amassed, the business in which you deal, the house in which you live. Allah is asking, what are your consideration? Are they your fathers? Are they your sons? Are they your brothers? Are they your spouses, husbands and wives? Are they your relatives? The wealth you have amassed, the business in which you deal, the house in which you live. Allah is asking, you know, some people may think, okay, I would not like to do this for my father. And Allah says, if you love all these eight things, and Allah continues, Ahabba ilaykum min Allahi wa rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabili. If you love all these things more than Allah, more than his Rasul, and more than doing jihad, striving and struggling in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, if you love all these eight things more than Allah your creator, more than the Rasul, the last and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, more than doing jihad, striving and struggling in his way, if you love all these eight things more than Allah, more than his Rasul, more than striving and struggling in his way, Allah continues, فَتَرَبَّسُوا wait. Wait until Allah brings about a decision unto you. 
until Allah bring the body destruction to you. And Allah continues, Wallahu la azulkum al-fasikin. And Allah guides not the fasik people. Allah in this verse of the Quran of Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 24, is asking you that what are your consideration? Do you love your father more than Allah? That if you, if you follow Allah's message, you may displease your father? Do you love your son more than Allah and his Rasul? That you love your sons and your children so much that you don't want to obey Allah and his Rasul? You love your brother so much more than Allah and his Rasul? Do you love your wife more than Allah and his Rasul? Your relatives? The wealth they have amassed? Oh, the wealth I have amassed, if I follow Allah and his Rasul, I may lose my wealth. What are you afraid of? The house in which you, de- you live. The business which you deal, that if I follow Allah and his Rasul, I may lose my business. Allah is asking, what are your consideration? If you love all these eight things, more than Allah, more than his Rasul, and more than doing jihad, striving and struggling in Allah's ways, Allah says, Fatarabbasu, wait, hatta ya'ti Allah bi amri. Until Allah brings about his decision unto you. Until Allah brings the destruction unto you. Wallahu la hadzukum al-fasikin. And Allah guides not the fasik people. The poverty transgressors. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Muhammad chapter number 47 verse number 38. Allah says, Yastab. Allah says, Fainta tawallahu. Yastab din kamun gairikum. Summa laakunam salakum. If you do not do your job, if you turn away from Allah's path, Allah says, Yes, common garakum. Allah will substitute in your place another people, Summa laikunam salakum, and they will not be like you. If you do not follow Allah's commandments, if you do not deliver the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if you don't implement on it, Allah says in the Quran, He will substitute in your place and other people and they will not be like you. And we see from various examples in the Quran. We see in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen the Yahud, the Jews, to deliver his message. But the Jews, they were proud of the message. They were proud of themselves. And they did not follow the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does Allah do? Allah substitute in their place another people. He gives the next revelation, the last and final revelation to the Arabs. And at that time, the Arabs were the most ignorant people of the world. It was known as Yomil Jahiliya, the days of ignorance. And the Jews used to look down upon the Arabs. The people who you look down upon, Allah makes them to sit on your head. With the revelation of the glorious Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the Arabs the torch bearers of the world. So the Jews did not do the job. They did not follow the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah substitute in their place another people, the Arabs. Now today, we are the Muslims. Allah is calling us the khaira ummah, the best of people. If we do not do our job, Allah will substitute in our place another people. And Alhamdulillah, Indonesia is supposed to be the largest population of Muslim in any country. 220 million. Y'all are capping, I'm happy. But do you know, when Allah has made you the largest population in the world, you also have a responsibility. Clapping is good, even I am happy to be in this country. But if you do not convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you do not deliver the message of Islam to the non-Muslims, if you do not deliver the message of Islam to the non-practicing Muslims, Allah will substitute you. Allah promises in the Quran that if you do not obey his commandments, what Allah has given in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, Allah will substitute in your place another people. It's good to have an honor, but when an honor is given, you have to maintain that position. If you do not maintain that position, Allah will take away that honor from you. And you see that. And we can see that I just came 
last week from Turkey. I was for a 10-day lecture tour in Turkey. And we know that the last Khilafat was in Turkey. In 1923, the Khilafat was abolished, the last Osmania dynasty by the enemies of Islam. And the country where I come from, India, and the city I come from is Bombay. They had taken out a demonstration from Bombay. It was known as Khilafat House, objecting to the demolition of Khilafat. And the enemies of Islam, what they do to defeat the Muslims, they create a fitna among the Muslims. They create division among the Muslims. If we Muslims are united, no one ever dare speak against us, act against us. The unfortunate part in us is that we are divided. And you know for many years, which was the headquarter of Islam, Turkey, Islam was being demolished. Women could not wear the hijab for several years. For 18 years, I am told that you could not give the adhan in the mosque. Alhamdulillah, since the last one decade, more than a decade, Alhamdulillah, we have a new leader coming in Turkey, Erdogan, President Erdogan, and Alhamdulillah, he is trying to revive get the glory back of Islam to Turkey. And here also in Indonesia, being the largest population of Muslim, you have to be the best example to the world that you are 220 million Muslims. 88% of your population are Muslims. You have to set an example to the world that if you want to see how a country should be ruled, it is like Indonesia. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have traveled in different parts of the world. I cannot say that there is a single country, Muslim country in the world, which is following 100% Quran and Sunnah. Unfortunate. When the non-Muslims ask me, Give me one example of a Muslim country. I have to say, I'm sorry. My knowledge is limited, but I don't know of a single Muslim country in the world which is following Quran and Sunnah. And I'm seeing in the last few decades, there is a revival of Islam in Indonesia. I see that more and more people in Indonesia are coming closer to Quran and Sunnah. I am told yet, the majority of the Indonesians who are Muslims are not on Quran and Sunnah, unfortunately. But very soon, inshallah, in the next few years, the majority, inshallah, in Indonesia will follow the guidance of Allah and His Rasul. And that's the reason I was happy. That being a Dai of Allah, the people of Batuka honoring me, I'm not a rock star, I'm not a singer, I'm not a politician, I'm not head of state. So these are the signs of a Muslim. That if you can respect and love a Dai of Islam, Inshallah, I feel Indonesia very soon will be an exemplary Muslim country to show to the world. And I'm seeing, Mashallah, almost all the ladies in hijab. And I see, Mashallah, the gents. Inshallah, the people here in this auditorium should inspire and call the other non-Muslims and Muslims closer to Quran and Sunnah. Don't worry if you say, okay, now if I talk about Dawa, if I talk about Islam, I will lose my seat, I will lose my position, I will cease to be a minister. I always tell the Muslims, don't bother about a kursi here. 
your chair bother about your seat in jannah this chair that we have today is temporary how long will you live 40 years 50 years 60 years 70 80 90 how many and the best example we find in the quran the wife of pharaoh Pharaoh, bibi asia she was the wife of the most powerful man in the world the most richest man in the world who was a Tagud who thought he was God? No, Billah. She, what does she do? It's mentioned in Surah Tahreem, chapter number 66, verse number 11. She prays to Allah, Oh my Lord, I would like to exchange my position in this world for a house in Jannah close to you. Imagine she wants to sacrifice all her wealth, her position, her status. In exchange for what? A house in Jannah close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, she is called as one of the four revered women. So much so that she is mentioned in the Quran. If today's Muslims politician, if they take the decisions as instructed by Allah and His Rasul, the world will be a different place irrespective whether they get the honor here or not whether they get the chair here or not whether they get the fame here or not the real success is the person who passes the test of this world and enters Jannah as Allah says in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 185 Kullu every soul shall have a taste of death the final recompense is on the day of judgment and the one who is saved from the hellfire and enters Jannah is the one who has achieved the purpose of this life otherwise this world is nothing but a mere chattel of deception what you are living in this world is temporary and alhamdulillah I see that the light when I'm moving around the world, I'm seeing the change in many Muslim countries. And I'm also seeing change in Indonesia. MashaAllah, you have leaders like the governor of Java. What you have, MashaAllah, I find him to be a good Muslim. And inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah guide him, help him, support him to take this country closer to Allah and his Rasul anyone it is you Allah says in the Quran Allah will not change the condition of a people unless they change themselves if you are close to Quran and Sunnah your leader will have to be close to Quran and Sunnah don't tell me the leader is like that you know I go to Muslim country they say what to do our leader is not Islamic you become Islamic if the people, common man becomes Islamic, the leader, even if he doesn't want to be Islamic, at least for his chair, he will become Islamic. This is a democracy. You are the common man. We are the common man who brings the change. If you say, I want to follow Quran and Sunnah, your leader will have to change. If not today, at least tomorrow. If not you, your children will reap the benefit. And what are we asking? We aren't asking something which is for a personal thing. We are asking the law of Allah and His Rasul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator. He is our sustainer. He is the best who knows what is good or bad for the human being. Can there be anyone better? Quran is the future world constitution, is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa It is the most positive book in the world. It is a proclamation to humanity. It is a fountain of mercy and wisdom. It's a warning to the heedless. It's a guide to the erring. It's an assurance to those in doubt. It's a solace to the suffering. 
and a hope to those in despair. How can we derive the benefits of the Quran unless we do not read it? Unless we do not understand it? If you know Arabic as a language, it is the best. If you don't know Arabic, read the translation of the Quran in the language you understand the best. If you know Indonesian, read in Indonesian, in Bahasa, in Java, in English, in Urdu. Whichever language you know the best, read it, understand it, and implement it. I would like to ask you a simple question. Who do you love the most in this world? Who do you love the most in this world? Allah, mashallah. Very simple question, very simple answer. We Muslims as a whole, we love Allah the maximum in this world, yes or no? Yes. We love Allah more than our mother, yes or no? More than our father, yes. We love Allah more than our mother, more than our father, more than our wife, more than our children. Do we love him or not? Yes or no? MashaAllah. <clears throat> I would like to ask you a question. That one day, when you go to your office for work, and when you're away from home, your neighbor, he abuses your mother, uses foul language against your mother, without any reason. She did not do anything yet. Your neighbor abuses your mother, uses foul language against your mother. When you come back home in the evening, and when you come to know that your neighbor has abused your mother, what will you do? What will you do? What will you do? Loudly. What will you do? Hit him. What will you do? Kill him. Someone is saying, hit him. I can hear someone saying, break his leg. Someone is saying, kill him. When someone abuses our mother, we love our mother, we respect our mother, and if someone abuses our mother without any rhyme or reason, what will you do? Someone will hit him, someone will break his leg, someone will kill him. If you cannot do it yourself, you will hire someone else to do the job. Will you or will you not? Yes! If you cannot do it yourself, you will hire somebody else to do the job. Why? Because we love our mother. How dare my neighbor use this foul language against my mother? If you cannot do it yourself, you will hire someone else to do the job. Yes or no? Yes. Why? Because we love our mother. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in the Quran, in Surah Maryam, chapter number 19, verse number 88 to 92, Allah says, وَقَالَ تَقَذُ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدَ They say that Allah has begotten a son. لَقَدْ جِيْتُمْ شَيْيًا إِدَّا Indeed, they have put forth a thing most monstrous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in the Quran that they are saying that Allah has begotten a son. If anyone says that Allah has begotten a son, it is the biggest abuse you can give to Allah. وَقَالُوا تَقَذُ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدَا لَقَدْ جِيْتُمْ شَيْيًا إِدَّا تَقَذُ السَّمَوَاتُ يَتَفَتَّنَّا مِنُّ If the sky had feelings, the sky would have burst open. وَتَنِشَكُ الْأَرْزُ The earth would have split open. وَتَقَرُّ الْجَبَالُ وَعَبْدَا And the mountain would have fallen down to utter ruin. Allah is saying that if anyone says Allah has begotten a son, it is the biggest abuse you can give to Allah. If the sky had feelings, the sky would have burst open. If the earth had feelings, the earth would have split asunder. 
the mountains which are known as power the mountains would have fallen down to utter ruins but to us muslims nothing is happening Every day we are seeing our non-Muslim brothers and sisters. They are abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are saying Allah has begotten a son. When we go to colleges, when we go to university, when we go to office place, we find our Muslim brothers and sisters telling that Allah has begotten a son. We find our Hindu brothers and sisters saying Allah has begotten a son. And we can't even open our mouth. We Muslims say we love Allah more than our mother, more than our father. When someone abuses your mother, you want to kill him, you want to break his leg, you want to hit him. Every day, our non-Muslim brothers and sisters, our Christian brothers and sisters, our Hindu brothers and sisters, they are abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not telling you go and hit them. I'm not telling you go and break their leg. I'm not telling you go and fight them. I'm not telling you go and kill them. Not at all. I'm only telling you open your mouth. At least object to them. Object to your friends. That Allah cannot beget a son. Allah is telling in the Quran if anyone says Allah has begotten a son. It is the biggest abuse you can give to Allah. I am not at all telling you go and fight them. I am not telling go and hit them. I am not at all telling you go and kill them. Not at all. I am against it. At least go and open your mouth. What has happened to our Muslims? Why are you so passive? At least go and tell them Allah cannot beget a son. Every we Muslims go to Salah. Correct? In the Salah, Imam is residing. After Surah Fatiha, Kul Allah Az. Say He's Allah one and only. Now those who come in the mosque, all of them believe Allah is one and only. Allah is telling you, go and tell outside. After you finish your Salah, Kul Allah Az. Say He's Allah one and only. Allah Samad, Allah the Absolute Eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not noise, he begotten. Wa lam yakulla hukufan ad. There's nothing like him. And my son, before my speech, he gave you a sample. How can you do dawa to a Christian? How can you do dawa to a Hindu? So easy. How can you do dawa to a Jew? Easy. Open your mouth. We say we love Allah more than our mother, more than our father, more than our wives. But do we actually mean it? It is a fard on every Muslim that he delivers the message of Islam. You don't have to fight. Open your mouth. We Muslims are afraid, we are scared to talk. You know many Muslims think, okay if I do dawah I will lose my business. You know, Alhamdulillah, I've got many non-Muslim friends. Many. Hundreds, thousands. They love me, they respect me. You know, when I come in the customs in India, that is more than eight, nine months back, whenever I come, the Hindu police officer, he says, Oh, Dr. Zakir, nah, jo bhi kahenge, such kahenge, such ke se wa kuch nahi. You know, whatever he'll say, he'll say the truth, he'll never speak a lie. You can just walk through the Green Channel. When I'm going to the non-Muslim shop to buy, many want to give me free. I'm not doing dawa to get free. They give me good discount. Even if they charge me double, no problem. I am doing for sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah raises your honor. Many people think that when we do dawa, we lose our business, we lose our honor. It is a fard for every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to those who are not aware of it. And Allah says in the Quran, Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 111, Allah says, The Jews and Christians, they say, 
you Muslims, you shall never enter Jannah unless you become a Jew or a Christian. وَقَالُوا لَيَّتْ قُلُوا الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارَى They say the Jews and Christians, you Muslims, you shall never enter Jannah with all your piety, with all your salah, with your mark on your forehead, with the zakat you give, with the fasting you do in the month of Ramadan, with the hajj you have performed, you shall never enter Jannah unless you become a Jew or a Christian. Allah replies, this is the wishful thinking. Bakwas hai bakwas. It is the vain desires. Kul, tell them. Ha, tu puranakum. Produce your proof. In kuntum sadikin, but if you're truthful. Allah is telling the, you to tell them. Kul, ha, tu puranakum. Produce your proof. In kuntum sadikin, but if you're truthful. And these Christian missionaries, they have produced the proof. That is their Bible in no less than 2,000 languages of the world. They say, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. My Bible says this, my Bible says that. What we have to do? Do we have to swallow the Bible hook, line and sinker? When someone shows his proof to you, when someone shows his identity card to you, what do you do? You verify whether it's correct or not. So when they are showing the Bible, what we have to do? We have to check the Bible whether it is correct or not. We don't have to swallow it hook, line and sinker. And I'm told that here in Indonesia, the Christian missionaries are very strong and they have been successful in converting hundreds of thousands of Muslims to Christianity. Imagine Indonesia being the largest population of Muslims in any country. You know what are they doing? They are using our Quran, our Quran against us. Leave aside you asking them about their Quran. They are using our Quran, our Quran against us. And you find the Christian missionaries traveling in different parts of the world, knocking at the doors of the Muslims. They knock your door and they ask you, isn't it mentioned in your Quran that Bible is the word of God? And most of us Muslims say yes. Then why don't you follow the Bible? You have no answer. They ask you the next question. How many times is the name of your last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, mentioned in the Quran, peace be upon him. If you know, you will say that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, by name, is mentioned in the Quran five times. Four as Muhammad, one as Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That's the next question. How many times is the name of Jesus, peace be upon him, mentioned in the Quran? If you don't know, they will tell you, he is mentioned 25 times by name in the Quran. And then they ask the next question, who is greater? A person who is mentioned five times by name in the Quran is greater? Or a person who is mentioned 25 times by name in the Quran is greater? Who is greater? Five times? Or 25 times? Which is greater? Five times or 25 times? Five. Indonesia, five is more than 25. If five is more than 25, according to you, so you give me five billion rupees, I will give you 25 billion rupees. Oh, sorry, you give me 25 billion rupees, I will give you five billion rupees. If five is more than 25, then I would request you to give me 25 billion rupees, and I will give you five billion rupees. Which is greater, five or 25? What? 25. These Christian missionary, they ask you the question, but they don't give you the reply. They let your mind think. They ask the next question. Your Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did he have a mother and father? We say, yes. He had a mother and father. Did Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, did he have a mother and father? We 
He said, no, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, had a mother, but he had no father. Then they asked the next question. Who is greater? A person who is born with a father is greater or a person who is born without a father is greater? Who is greater? A person who is born with a father is greater or a person who is born without a father is greater? A person born without a father. They ask you the question, they don't give you the reply, they let your mind think. They are using our Quran, our Quran against us and we can't even open our mouth. They are using us Muslim like doormats, like punching bags. And when you go and ask a Sheikh, Sheikh, what should I reply? Shaitan! These are certain questions. Don't talk to them. It's a question. They are quoting Quran. They ask the next question. Is your Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is he dead or alive? We say spiritually he's alive, but physically he's dead. He's buried in Medina. Is Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, is he dead or alive? And we have to agree he's alive. You're right. Quran says that. Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 158, that Allah raised him up alive. So who's greater? A prophet who's dead is greater, or a prophet who's alive is greater? They ask you the question, they don't give you the reply, they let your mind think. That's the next question. That your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did you do miracles? We say, yes, he did many miracles. They ask the next question, do you know of any miracle in which prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave life to the dead? And we have to agree, nowhere in the Quran, nowhere in the authentic hadith, ever do we know that prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave life to the dead. Then they ask the next question. Did Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did he give life to the dead? And we have to agree. The Quran says, Bismillah. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Wake up in the name of Allah. Yes. Jesus, peace be upon him, give life to the dead. So who is greater? A prophet who can give life to the dead is greater or a prophet who cannot give life to the dead is greater? Who is greater? Who is greater? A prophet who can give life to the dead is greater or a prophet who cannot give life to the dead is greater? They ask you the question, but they don't give you the reply. They are using as Muslims like punching bags, like dough mats, and we can't even open our mouth. We are like sitting ducks. I am not asking you to go and fight them. I am only telling you, read the Quran with translation. All these answers are there in the Quran. You can see my video cassettes, all these answers are there. You Google today, go on the YouTube, it's there. Simple. You don't have to do too much research. Just type on the YouTube and you'll get the reply. This age of science and technology. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 120, Allah says, Walan tarda ankal Yehudu, walan nasara hatta tattab yumilatiyum. The Jews and the Christians, they will never be satisfied until you follow their brand of religion. Allah says, the Jews, Yehud and Nasara will never be satisfied unless you become a Yehud or Nasara. It is the duty of us Muslims that we should convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslims. I know that Indonesia is a secular country and I'm told they recognize five religions, Islam being the largest. You have Christianity, you have Hinduism, you have Buddhism, You know what Allah says in the Quran? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, Inna dina in the Allah al Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. 
in the sight of Allah only one religion acceptable that is the religion of peace Islam religion of submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is the duty of the majority of the people in Indonesia who call themselves Muslims that they should convey the message of Islam to those who don't know about the message of Islam it's your fard Don't think that you lose your business, that you lose your wealth, you lose your house, you lose your parents, you lose your wife, you lose your children. A good businessman is that we see that in the long term he benefits. This world you are living is only temporary. Leave aside we Muslims doing dawah to the non-Muslims and correcting them we don't do dawah that is one thing we even go and become party to them you know during the time of Christmas many Christmas uh, many Muslims when they meet the Christians they say Merry Christmas you know if you are telling anyone Merry Christmas what are you doing you are giving shahada you are bearing witness knows billah that Allah begot a son on the 25th of December leave aside correcting them you are going and becoming party to them because the Christians they celebrate Christmas the 25th of December as the birthday of Jesus Christ peace be upon him who they consider to be son of God who they consider to be God that means when you wish the Christian Merry Christmas you are giving Shahada Nauz Billah that Allah begot a son on the 25th of December leave aside doing dawah to them you are becoming party to them and you are doing shirk I am not telling go and fight them ask them a simple question who is this Jesus Christ peace be upon him And if they say Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is the son of God, can God have a son? See my video cassettes, easy. Don't have to fight with them. Ask them simple questions. All these are there. Open your mouth. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64. Kul, ya hai kitab Say, O people of the book Talo ila kalimatin sawa in bainan o bainakum Come to common terms as with us and you Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah That we worship none but Allah Wala nushka bhi shayyum That we associate to partners with him Wala yattakhi zabad dun abad dun arbab dun mundin illa That we erect not among ourselves Lords and patrons other than Allah Fine tawallah If then they turn back Fakulu shadu Say ee bear witness Bianna muslimun That we are muslims Bowing away to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala This verse of the glorious Quran According to me Is the master key for doing dawah Come to common terms As between us and you Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah that we worship none but Allah and you heard my son before my speech he demonstrated how easy it is to do dawah with the Christians with the Jews with the Hindus you don't have to fight with them you only have to quote the scripture there is not a single unequivocal statement Anywhere in the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God over, he says, worship me. Simple. Don't have to fight them. Don't have to hit them. Open your mouth. It's easy. There are many Muslims who come and tell me, you know, brothers Akir, we would want to do dawa, but we don't have knowledge. <coughs> They want to wait till they become like Sheikh Ahmad Didad and then start doing dawah. That time will never come. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, Balligo Anni Walo Aya. 
propagate even if you know one verse. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Balligu anni vayo aya. Even if you know one verse about Islam, as long as you know it correctly, it is your duty to propagate it. It's your fard. Every Muslim, at least he knows there's one God. Go and tell your non-Muslim friend, why don't you believe in one God? If they ask you, why should I believe? If you don't know, come home and do your homework. I've given a lecture on, is the Quran God's word? Does God exist? Where I've proved scientifically the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see this lecture? Memorize it. Go and give him the answer. Now, you are the master of an answer. Then go and tell him, why don't you believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the last and final messenger? A non-Muslim ask you, why should I believe? If you don't know, come and do your homework. I have given a lecture, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the various world religious scriptures, where I have proved from the scriptures of the major world religions that all the major world religions, they say that the last and final messenger is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now when you hear this lecture and you memorize it, you are the master of two answers. <clears throat> then tell them, why don't you offer salah? They will ask you, why should you offer salah? If you don't know the answer, come and do your homework. I have given a lecture on Salah, the programming towards righteousness. Now when you see this, now you are the master of answers to three questions. Slowly, slowly, you start doing that one, Allah will keep on giving you more knowledge. I, while I was in my medical college, I saw Shaykh Didar's tape, I was inspired by him, and I started doing Dawah. I used to stammer. I used to stammer since childhood. If someone used to ask me, what is your name? I would say, my name is Zaza Zaza Zakir. I used to stammer. But when I started doing Dawah, after being inspired by Sheikh Didad, when I spoke with the non-Muslims, the stammering vanished. By mistake, once I came on the stage, most of the human beings, when they come on the stage, they shiver. Alhamdulillah, I did not stammer. I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor in the world. In your dream, you can dream of anything, right? Because I used to stammer, I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor in the world. I could not have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people in the world. In front of 25 people. I was a stammer, I could not dream. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just because little bit dawah I did, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept on giving me more knowledge. Yet, I'm only a student of knowledge. And now see, mashallah, in a foreign country, I'm told there are 12,000 people here. I couldn't have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. And now I'm speaking in front of 12,000 people. Alhamdulillah. You have to make a beginning. You don't have to say that you'll wait till you become like Sheikh Dida, the time will never come. Whatever you know, you can raise the message. Some Muslims come and tell me that Brother Zakir, first we want to make the Musliman Pakka Musliman. We want to make the Muslims good Muslims and then we we'll start doing Dawa. I said, yes, both are important, Dawa and Islam. When you meet a non-Muslim do Dawah, when you meet a Muslim do Islam. But if suppose two patients come to the doctor, one who has a heart attack and the other one has a common cold, which patient should the doctor treat first? The one with the heart attack or one with the common cold? Heart attack. Why? If he doesn't treat, he will die. So when, so speaking to non-Muslims about Islam is more important. If you have time, do both. If the doctor has time, he will treat both the patient with heart attack as well as common cold. But 
it is your duty that to convey your message to the non-Muslims. And the more you start doing dawah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep on helping and opening up your pathways. There are some Muslims who come and tell me, that Brother Zakir, when we do dawah to non-Muslims, they tell us, mind your own business. So I give them an example. That if you are going with your, with your family, to a hill station. Maybe Batu, I think Batu is a hill station here. Indonesia. If you're going to a hill station along with your family, and while you're talking to your wife, your young son of four years old, Ahmad, he slips away from you. And by the time you realize, you see that he's walking towards the edge of the cliff. You want to shout, Ahmad, be careful, but your voice cannot reach. There you see an elderly gentleman who's admiring beauty standing at the edge of the cliff with his hand folded. You want to shout, oh, mister, please save my son. But your voice cannot reach He's very far. This elderly gentleman, while admiring beauty, he looks at your son. He sees your son walking towards closer to the edge of the cliff. He looks at him, smiles, and continues admiring beauty. Only, you want to shout, please save my son, but a voice cannot reach. After a few seconds, your son takes one more step and he falls over the cliff. I'm asking you the question, will you or will you not blame that elderly gentleman? He could have saved your son. He did not save. So will you or will you not blame that elderly gentleman? Yes or no? Yes. You will say, he didn't even have to take a step forward. The only thing he had to do was stretch his hand. And my son would have saved. But that elderly gentleman tells you, I was minding my own business. And he's right. He didn't push your son. He didn't tell your son to jump. So why should you blame him? Yet you will blame him. You will tell that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him wisdom. He's an elderly gentleman. My son, four years old, masoom, innocent. Even then you will blame him. Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Similarly, on the day of judgment, when these mushriks will be put to hell, they will blame us Muslims. That these Muslims who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave hidayah to, why didn't they deliver the message to us? And what will you reply? These non-Muslims will hold us responsible for not delivering the message to them. It is compulsory duty for every Muslim that he should convey the message of Islam to those who are not aware of it. It is fard. You have no excuse. If anyone tells me, non-Muslim tells me, that while doing da'wah, if he tells me, mind your own business, I will tell him, that's what I'm doing. It is the business of every Muslim to mind other people's business as far as deen is concerned. Please listen to my answer carefully. If a non-Muslim tells me, while doing da'wah, mind your own business, so you tell him, that's what I'm doing. I'm minding my business. It is the business of every Muslim to mind other person's business as far as deen is concerned. It's compulsory. Imagine you have a neighbor who's a non-Muslim, who's a mushrik. You don't deliver the message to him. On the day of judgment, Allah will ask him, your non-Muslim neighbor, why didn't you accept Islam? He uh, say, no one gave me the message. Allah will say, it was your duty to find out. Allah will put him in hell. Allah will ask you, did you deliver the message to your neighbor? And if you say no, you will follow him. You will follow him because it is fard for every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to those who are not aware of it. Allah is very clear. 
Allah specifies very clearly in the Quran the criteria for any human being go to Jannah. Allah says in Surah Al Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, Wal Asr. By the token of time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking an oath of time. Inna al insana la fi khasr. Verily, man is in khasara, a state of loss. Allah is taking an oath of time and telling man is verily in state of loss. Illa ladina amunu, wa amunu solihati, wa tawasaw bil haqq, wa tawasaw bil sabr. Except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. This Surah Surah Al-Asr is called as Rahi Nijad, the path to salvation. That Allah is saying man is verily in a state of loss, is in khasara. Unless he has four things, he has four criteria. Number one, Iman, belief. Number two, amal saliha righteous deed. Number three, watawasaw bil haq, inviting people to truth, doing dawah and islah. Number four, watawasaw bil sabr, exhorting people, inviting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these four criteria are missing, under normal circumstances, according to Surah Al-Asr, you shall not enter Jannah. You may be a very good Muslim. You may be, you may be praying five times a day. You may be fasting in the month of Ramadan. You may be giving zakat. But if you do not do dawah, under normal circumstances, according to Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, you shall not enter Jannah. Only doing dawah is also not sufficient. All four are equally important. Iman, righteous deed, watawasawbil haqq, dawah and nisla, watawasawbil sabr, inviting people to patience and civil. This is our rahi nijat, our success. Our success in this world is not our degree that we get. I am a doctor, MBBS. It is not the fame you get in this world. I've got so many followers, you know, on the Facebook, on the Twitter. I've got so many audience coming. This is not success. Success in the world is not the position you hold, that you're the prime minister of the country, or the president of the country, or you are the president of an organization. Success in the world is not the wealth you have amassed, that I'm a millionaire, that I'm a billionaire. Success in this world is not the big house you live in. Success in the world is not the big car that you drive in. Success in the world is not the jet plane you own. If we Muslims realize this, only this one surah, Imam Shafi, may Allah have mercy on him, he said that if this surah al-Asr would have been revealed, this surah alone, would have been sufficient for the hidayah of humanity. Imam Shafi. May Allah have mercy on him. He said that only if this surah, one surah of four verses would have been revealed, that alone would have been sufficient for humanity. Why? This surah al-Asr is the essence of the Quran. If you want to go to Jannah, you have to have Iman. Every verse of the Quran you pick up. It's either talking about Iman, it's talking about Saleha, Bil Haq, Bil Sabr. If you understand this one surah alone, if we understand when you sit for an examination, you want to know what are the rules and regulations. The rules and regulations for this test we are leading. Allah says in Surah Mul, chapter number 6 and verse number 2, Alladhi khalaqal mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. Today that we are leaving this slide, on average, maybe 50, 60, 70 years you live. Some live, some die at the age of 20, some 30, some 80, some 100. This life that you are leading is a temporary life. 
Unfortunately, we human beings, including most of us Muslims, we think success is having a big house. Success is having a big salary. Success is having a big following. Success is having a big position. People think wealth is success. All these things are nothing but chattels of deception. The real success is entering Jannah. The real success is Iman. The real success is Amal Saleha. The real success is Watawasaw Bil Haq. The real success is Watawasaw Bil Sabr. Tawa. And inviting people to patient and perseverance. All these other things are glitter and glamour that will take you away from your position. You know, beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that there are some Sahabas, some people of Allah, who no one wants to listen to them, who no one wants to take their recommendation, who no one wants to talk to them, no one wants to invite them. They are looked down upon in the world. But if by mistake, they take an oath of Allah, Allah keeps the word of his servants. Even by mistake they take an oath, Allah fulfills it. This is success. You may think, what is that man? Oh, no one listened to him. He is not educated, no degree, no money, no house. He has been promised Jannah. So if we Muslims realize what is our purpose in this life, in this world, if we realize what is success, it is Iman that we have. It is Amal Saleha. If we follow Quran and the say Hadith, inshallah you'll be successful. That's the reason according to Surah Al-Asr, it is compulsory that every Muslim should at least be a part-time die. A part-time die. Compulsory. Otherwise you shall not enter Jannah. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 104, that let there arise out of you a band of people, a group of people that enjoin people towards the good and forbid them from doing wrong. These are the ones that shall attain felicity. How, you know, today in the world, we have full-time doctors, full-time engineers, full-time lawyers, full-time businessmen. How many full-time dies do you have? How many? How many dies do we have that are going on the international level and spreading the deen? You can count them on your fingertips. The Christian missionaries, there are hundreds of thousands. In this verse, Allah says that let there arise out of you a band of people talking about full-time dies who enjoin people to the good and forbid them from doing wrong. These are the ones that Allah says will get the highest stature in Jannah. Talking about full-time dies. Being part-time dawah is a fard on a Muslim. Full-time dai is the best profession. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 125 Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a promise in the glorious Quran in no less than three different places. In Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 33 in Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9, and in Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28, Allah says, Huwa allazi arsal rasulahu bilhuda wa dil haq liyuz hira wa aladdine kulli. Allah is saying in the Quran that Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the reign of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other isms, whether it be atheism, whether it be secularism, whether it be Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam is destined to supersede all, kulle, master them all. And Allah ends the verse by saying, 
that walaqayil mushrikun even though the mushrik don't like it even if the non muslim don't like it this deen of allah will prevail over all the other religions Allah repeats this message for the third time with a different ending. Who Allah the Arsal Rasul of Allah? What din al haq liyudhira wa al din kulle? Allah sent his messenger with guidance, the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He has sent him with guidance and the religion of truth, so that it will prevail over all the other religions, all the other isms, whether it be secularism. Whether it be atheism, whether it be communism, whether it be Christianism, whether it be Judaism, whether it be Hinduism, whether it be Buddhism, Islam is destined to supersede all. Kulle, master them all. Allah ends the message by saying, "Wa kafa billahi shahida." Allah is sufficient as a witness. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala does not require you and me to make His deen prevail. Allah alone is sufficient. Allah doesn't require you and me the rubbish that we are. If I start thinking I'm doing dawa, therefore Islam is spreading. I'm the biggest fool in the world. Allah does not require me to make His Deen prevail. If I start thinking that because of peace TV Islam is spreading, I am the biggest fool in the world. Allah can create a million Dr. Zakir Naik within a second. Allah can create a million Peace TV within a second. Allah is giving us an opportunity to do a profit job and to earn a profit's reward. Allah is giving us an opportunity. Allah doesn't require you and me the rubbish that we are. Whether you do the hour or not, whether I do the hour or not, Islam is bound to supersede all. Whether you do the hour or not, Islam is going to come in this world, including Indonesia, full. Allah wants to see whether you want to take part in it or not. Allah doesn't require you. Allah doesn't require me. Allah is giving you an easy opportunity to go to Jannah. To go to Jannah. Allah Himself is sufficient. This deed of Allah. Whether all the human beings put together don't want this deen to prevail. You know we have the enemies of Islam, the Western countries attacking us. The more they attack Islam, the more Islam is spreading. We have to take a promise today that inshallah, inshallah, we will see to it that we spread the message of Islam. Will we or not? Will we spread the message or not? Will we convey the message to the non-Muslim? Yes or no? Yes. Inshallah, we take it upon ourselves that those Muslims who are not practicing Islam, as per the Quran and Sunnah, we will convey the message to them. Yes or no? Yes. Whether we like it or not, Islam is going to prevail. Allah has promised in the Quran. I have given you references. Go home and check it. Anyone tells you anything else? Oh, this is voting. This is that. Forget about it. Allah is sufficient alone. This is the opportunity to get an easy reward in the Akhirah. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Fussilat, chapter number forty-one, verse number thirty-three, which says, "Allah says that woman has to call a mimman doil Allahi, wa amal salihau, call a inna ni min al Muslimin." Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says that I am a Muslim? Wa akhirul dawana. Alhamdulillahirabbilalamin.